Doing scientific research is difficult already. And adding a requirement to do random sampling just compounds that difficulty. It takes additional time and money and effort to identify and recruit participants. Perhaps you even have to pay them or provide some other incentive for them to participate. It's difficult. It's just not very convenient. And so, a technique for sampling that is used by many researchers is called convenience sampling. And convenience sampling is exactly what it says on the tin. It is selecting a sample based on a group that is convenient to the researcher. I used to teach Introduction to Psychology. When I taught, I was in a classroom with 300 students. It was a huge classroom, and everyone had to sign up for Intro to Psychology class. Because everyone had to sign up, eventually everyone had to go through. It's kind of like they signed up randomly Right? This is kind of a random sample already, and it has the additional advantage of being very convenient for me to sample. In fact, in my introductory psychology courses, there was a research requirement. Everyone had to participate in several units of scientific research. They had to volunteer to be a subject. Now, there was an alternative. You could do something else instead of being a participant, but usually that something else was writing book reports or reviewing scientific literature that students typically didn't want to do, and they found it easier, more convenient, and probably more fun to become a scientific participant. However, I got really curious about the quality of participants that we were getting at various times in the semester. And so I worked with a colleague, Ashley Takens, who helped me collect data about the individuals in our introductory psychology course who were participating in research. Our variables of interest had to do with the big five personality factors. And the one that I really wanted to focus on was conscientiousness. Now, conscientiousness is a personality trait that has to do with the level of effort that you put into something. If you have a friend who is very conscientious and you ask that friend to help you move a refrigerator at nine o'clock on Saturday morning, your conscientious friend will be there at nine o'clock ready to get to work. A non-conscientious friend either would be late or wouldn't show up. High conscientiousness individuals are qualitatively different from low conscientiousness individuals and that might have an effect on their ability to participate in scientific research. And so, we did three rounds of data collection. We collected data on conscientiousness and other factors at the very beginning of the semester. You see, I'm high conscientiousness. I like to work ahead, I like to plan, I like to prepare. And so I had a survey ready to go first day of class. Any students in that class who left their first class learning about their research requirement could immediately go and sign up for my survey, which I left open for about two weeks. I closed down the survey but reopened it around midterms. After two weeks, I closed it again and opened it in the last two weeks of class. I wanted to find out if the level of conscientiousness was the same or different across the semester. And so Ashley helped me to analyze the data and she created an award-winning poster and here is what we found. This first graph shows the significant findings. The blue line is conscientiousness, the red line is agreeableness. What we see is that the level of conscientiousness is roughly the same at the beginning and at midterms. However, both agreeableness and conscientiousness drop off statistically significantly from those students who were participating late in the semester. Another significant finding was this line graph of self-reported GPA. The GPA of students who signed up early in the semester dropped by midterms and dropped again by late in the semester. The non-significant findings were for openness, extroversion, and neuroticism. Here's the takeaway. If you are a researcher and you need highly conscientious students, 
your best time to get those students is at the beginning of the semester. On the other hand, there's another implication that researchers who don't get around to posting their research until later in the semester, who may themselves be low conscientiousness, are gathering more low conscientiousness students. Essentially, the results of your study could be different based simply on what time in the semester you do your research. And this, as you may imagine, is the primary weakness of convenience sampling. There are advantages and disadvantages. The biggest advantage is it's quick, it's easy, it's cost effective, and that is why many researchers would choose convenience sampling. This is not to say that convenience sampling is always bad. Because it is quick, doing convenience sampling, sampling those who are readily available, is a good way to spot emerging trends. It might be used as a pilot study. You can very quickly and easily gather data that gives you a snapshot of how things seem to be, and you can follow up from that to determine whether or not you wanted to do a larger, more full-scale, random sampling technique for your research. A disadvantage for convenient sampling is the bias. It's impossible to know if this convenient sample is representative of a population. And it is low power. It does not allow us to generalize or to distinguish between subgroups. Convenient sampling is very convenient. That's why it gets used so much. But we must use convenient sampling with care.